The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Savior and risen Jesus on this wonderful day that the good Lord has given to us that we can be here in his house and continue to receive his Easter blessings. Uh, announcements are going to be short here because we're here to worship and praise and thank and all that good stuff. So here's what I got. First of all, thank you to the elders for breakfast. Let's give them a round. And we're also thankful they didn't set the kitchen on fire, so that's always a good thing. All right. Then, I want to remind the congregation that the Zoom Bible class we've been doing on Wednesday nights, which we suspended for Lent, will be returning this Wednesday. So if you would like to join us, the link will be sent out to you in an email later this week. But we'll be continuing our study on stuff they didn't teach me in Sunday school. You also have the opportunity to have your picture taken as a family in front of our Easter display that will go on our kind of directory board that we have going on up there. If you have any questions about what I'm talking about there, talk to Sheila. She'll be able to clue you in. And then... Uh, Finally, we just want to make sure we get our birthday greetings out there to uh, Evan Drum, uh, Koei Keelan, and my brother, who turned 60-something today. And uh, Tristan Rudat's got a birthday Thursday, Tristan, is that right? Thursday? Okay. And then uh, Friday, Stephen Gady. And then congratulations to uh, Scott and Sherry Kettner and uh, Russell and Cardinaline Rupp for over 30 years of wedded bliss. Okay. All right. Am I forgetting anything? Are we ready to roll here? Okay, so then everybody stand up for the first song, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, forgive sin. But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are forgiven. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your punishment now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our next song.
All right, while I put my music in place here for the next song, we will point out that the devil may try to distract us with feedback and such things, because everything was working before the service started, but we're not going to let him win. We're going to keep going. Our theme today is Nothing Stops God here, so. Okay. Okay, so the Old Testament reading for this, the resurrection of our Lord, is from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, the congregation will please stand for the Easter gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We confess our faith this morning with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of 
one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. This is taught by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for our new Easter song of the month.
The Easter Gospel and the text for your sermon today, the biblical basis for our thoughts together here this morning is Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. I'm starting with kind of an odd question here, but have you ever seen a tomb in the Holy Land? Because what we're talking about here with Jesus and the tomb, if especially if you were wealthy, the average tomb for the well-to-do would be this basically a hole inside of a hill. And the hole would be circular, but then there'd be a square framework around it. And let's, let's just pretend there's like a chalkboard here, or a picture here. And so you have the square frame, circle in the middle, which is the opening, and then there'd be this incline. They would build this thing up here and put the stone, which was round, and would fit this hole. And then they had a little triangular thing, you know, a stone to stick in there to keep it from rolling. So when you put the person, the remains, in the tomb, you'd pull that thing out, it would roll into the hole, and then there were things to keep it from falling out, that once it hit that hole, it was stuck. It would fill that hole, it would seal, and it would be really, 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 really hard to open that thing again. And that makes sense, right? Because who wants to open a tomb once it's been used, shall we say? Because you open that thing up and, you know, that's, good. that's a good place for a stick-up, right? Remember those commercials years ago? <laughs> and this is why Jesus, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, you remember he waited a few days before he went off to Bethany. And the reason he did that was because there would be no debate whether or not Lazarus was dead before he raised him. When they opened his tomb, which took quite a bit of work, when they opened that thing up, there was a, and then everyone knew he was dead. No one could say, well, he was just in a coma. He had just fallen asleep. When they opened that thing up, they knew he was dead. So they were designed to stay closed. Okay? So we believe that this was the kind of tomb that Jesus was placed in. Joseph of Arimathea was fairly wealthy. He could have had such a tomb with a circular stone in front of it, waiting for his burial. And when he put Jesus in the tomb with some help from Nicodemus, he would have pushed the stone and started it down the track. And you can imagine the sound it would have made when it got there into the front of the tomb, it would have gone, thud. And here's where I wish our sound system had a, uh, a subwoofer, you know, because this would be a good subwoofer moment. Thud, right? The stone in front of Jesus' tomb was very large, Mark says in our gospel. It was huge. And so after it went, thud, it was not going to be moved without a great deal of effort. When it went, thud, it was there to stay, or so it seemed. And this is kind of what happened in the lives of those who uh, were with Jesus or who Jesus knew well. Because everything on Good Friday came to an end with a thud. The stone rolled in front of the tomb and everything comes to a halt. His apostles have run for their lives. Two men, Joseph and Nicodemus, have risked everything to bury him. Because remember, as I told you a couple of times last week, when the Romans crucified somebody, they did not allow that corpse to be buried. They left it up on the, cr the cross as a message to others saying, you mess with us, this is what's going to happen to you. And so for Joseph and Nicodemus to go to Pilate and say, we want the remains of Jesus, Pilate could have said, we're going to nail you to one now. But Pilate didn't do that because he knew Jesus was innocent. So then some women are standing at a distance to see where Jesus is buried. His body is covered in darkness and surrounded by silence. He's dead. And that great big stone is in front of the tomb. And that is where we left off Friday night. So I suppose I could have started off the sermon by saying previously in the Passion. But today is Act 3. If you took part in our services Thursday and Friday, uh, or if you watched them online, you know that 
like we did last Sunday in the one sermon, we have broken down Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday and Easter into like three acts. Not that this is you know, fiction, but as a way to frame it and outline it, okay? So today is act three of the Our Salvation drama. And so very early on that first Easter morning, everything changed, right? The women are coming up the path to anoint Jesus' body with, uh, with spices to cover up the odor of death, but they're not strong enough to move that stone that's covering the tomb. They're ready to take care of the body of Jesus, but they've forgotten one little detail. How are they going to get in there? And when they get there, that small little detail, which is actually a very big, heavy detail, has already been taken care of. The stone, that large stone, has been pushed away. In Matthew's account, he says an angel did it. Mark doesn't tell us how it got to be opened. But the way I like to think of it, let's put it this way. I've been talking a lot about bacon the last couple of weeks, actually last couple of months. But today I'm going to talk about a chocolate chip cookie. Let's presume for a moment you're chomping on a chocolate chip cookie and a crumb falls off and lands on your sleeve. Now, if it's a big crumb, you're going to pick it up and eat it, right? But if it's just a little crumb, you're just going to go flick, and that crumb is gone, right? Well, I think that's the way God approached that tomb rock covering that hole. It would have taken several men and levers and pulleys and whatever else they had for engineering back in Jesus' day to open that thing. But for God, he looked at that rock and he just went flick and it was open. Okay? From a loud thud to a little flick and the tomb is open because that's what God can do. And as we just sang, nothing is going to stop our God on Easter Sunday. Now, the next thing we read in Mark is that the women are amazed, and that's Mark's favorite word. If you read Mark's gospel, you'll see the word amazed a lot. The women are amazed and afraid, and you might think that that's kind of a weird combination. But if we stop and think about it for a second, it isn't. And the, the speaker on the Lutheran Hour, I think his name is Dr. Ziegler, I think. That's not Ziegler. Anyway, whatever his name is. The speaker on the Lutheran Hour mentioned this this morning, so I'm going to give him credit because this is where I heard it on my way to church here this morning. But he, he, he reminded us that when it comes to fear, sometimes we're afraid when really you know, good and happy things happen. As an example, you find out you're going to have a baby, especially the first baby. And at first you're excited and you're like, yeah, we're going to have a kid. And then you go, oh, we're going to have a kid. You know? And you start thinking, am I going to be a good parent? And you start thinking about all the things that might go wrong. So you're excited and afraid at the same time, right? Another example I can give you is from my life. When I graduated from the seminary in 1991, <clears throat> 30 years ago, don't know how that happened, I was so excited because I was done with school because I'd been in school for 23 years. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a pastor now. And then when I got my diploma and I started heading up to Michigan, I was like, I'm going to be a pastor now. Right? So there was that excitement, also that fear, you know, I hope I don't mess this up. Well, I think that's what's going on with those women there. And remember that this gospel was written to comfort the Christians in Rome who were being persecuted by Nero. And they were all afraid. They were all afraid of being thrown in a, an, an, you know, a den with animals and being mauled and eaten alive. And so Mark is telling them it's okay to be afraid. But be excited too because that tomb is empty. And the Lord is risen. Oh, do that again. You can add, add the alleluia there. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. That's better. We'll have it down by the end of the Easter season. All right. So that angel there, he's got that message. And the heart of the message is this. He's risen. The body's not in the tomb anymore. He's alive and he's going to meet his apostles just as he said he would. Now that message is huge. No matter what good news you've ever had with family, friends, or whatever, it's nothing compared to what that angel told them. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is larger than any stone. It is larger than anything ever. No stone could keep Jesus in there, no matter how large. And the women go in no longer to anoint a body, but to hear words that will loom large <clears throat> for the rest of their lives. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. 
now you're getting it. So just as he said he would, Jesus meets his disciples over and over again for the next uh, 40 days. And you heard about those get-togethers in the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians that I read for a few moments ago. And during a couple of those reunions, a funny thing happens because Jesus is with his apostles and he eats a, 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 a piece of fish. And if you're asking why this is such a big deal, well, it's because Jesus is not auditioning for a Ghostbusters remake. He's not a phantom. He's flesh and blood. And the people in those days were very superstitious and it could have been said, well, Jesus wasn't really there. He's just a ghost. Well, ghosts don't eat, right? So Jesus is flesh and blood. The scars are there for Thomas to touch and believe. And the simple message, he is risen, is larger than any stone, larger than anything that could ever keep him from his followers. Jesus' resurrection is big! And that was true for them. And it's also true for us. It matters in our lives today. It changes everything in our lives today. And let me give you an example of how this works. I read about a pastor that before he went off to the seminary, he worked in a cemetery as a grave digger. And obviously that's kind of a, a unique occupation for someone to do before going to seminary. Now I do have a little experience with this. When I went to seminary back in 1987, I'm sitting in my first classes and the professors would walk out and they'd say, okay, let's go around, everybody state your name, where are you from, and what did you do before you came here? And so most guys were saying, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Joe Schmidt and I came from Chicago and I went to Concordia River Forest and I just you know, got my bachelor's and came right here to seminary. But then they get to meet. Uh, my name's Mark Erler, I'm from West Bend, Wisconsin, and before I came here, I worked as a radio announcer. And most of my professors went, what? Really? What was that like? Because there aren't a lot of DJs that go from the radio station studio to the seminary, you know? Well, here we have this guy who was a grave digger before he went to seminary, and they would uh, dig the graves and after the committal service, fill them in. Well, one time they were put to work, and this was an especially difficult one because the person who died was an eight-year-old boy who had drowned in a nearby creek. And so when the service was over, the mother wanted to stay and watch the burial. And these two brothers told her, I don't think you really want to do that. Because when the dirt goes into the grave, that phrase, dust to dust, becomes too real, right? But she wouldn't leave. She wanted to stay. So the grave digger, soon to be seminarian, started to push the dirt into the grave. Now I'm going to get back to this story here in a couple minutes. But... For now we note that grief and sorrow are so painful, right? Folks sit down to eat at the table and an empty chair stares back. No sounds of laughter, the plate is in the cupboard, the silverware sits quietly in the drawer instead of clanging on the table, the glass is on a shelf instead of a drink being swallowed, someone is missing, a voice has disappeared. And I'm assuming for all of us in this room, maybe not for some of the younger folks, but for all of us adults, I assume that we've all been through this at some point in our lives, I certainly but not for Jesus. The day will come when he will return in power and glory, and the silence will be shattered and the darkness will be undone, and he will come to your grave and my grave and the graves of all who have followed him, and those gravestones and the dirt that's on top of our coffins, flick, away it's going to go. And out we're going to come. Bodies alive once again. Hands and feet that will hug. Hands and feet that will dance. This is as good as I dance. This is as good as it gets. But we'll have eyes to see the beauty of God's new creation. Because remember, when he comes back, it's with a new heaven and a new earth. And ears to hear the songs of praise that will make our loud and joyous Easter singing here today seem like a whisper. And we'll be surrounded by those who love Jesus. And we'll be laughing and we'll be talking. And think for a second about that noisy celebration when Jesus comes back to bring us all with him. All because Jesus is larger than the stone. He's larger than anything that would try to block him and keep him from doing his thing to save us. Isaiah said in the first reading this morning that the Lord God will swallow up death forever and tears will be wiped away from our eyes. And all those things are too small to stop Jesus on the last day, the day of our resurrection. As we just sang, there's nothing that can stop our God. 
So going back to the story that I started earlier, when the soon-to-be seminarian gravedigger began to fill in the young boy's grave, the mother began to sob, her sh shoulders were shaking. She was acting how you would expect any mother who's just buried her eight-year-old to act. So while the gravedigger, soon-to-be seminarian, is doing his thing, his brother went over to her. Now this guy was described in, in the story that I read as a hunter and a fisherman, you know. <laughs> now what was that? The devil's trying to stop me here, folks. He's not gonna. All right, so anyway, this guy's described as a hunter, a fisherman, a real manly man, right? Not the kind of guy you'd expect to be in touch with his feelings, right? But he goes over to this woman, he puts his arm around her, and he says real quietly to her, did you have your son baptized? Now she couldn't say anything, but she nodded. And then like an angel, many years earlier, he said to that, as a, a, then like an angel, many years earlier, had said to some women in an empty tomb, this big burly guy assured her that her son was with Jesus. And he told her that one day she would see her son again. The simple message, he is risen, changes everything. Like I keep telling you, it's larger than any stone, larger than anything that could keep us from Jesus, and that incre incredible feast that will take place on the day of our resurrection. But it's not just on that last day. If you're thinking, oh great, we know that because of what Jesus did, we're going to be okay at the end, but until then, you know, stuff happens. Well, know this too. Jesus' resurrection is larger than any stone every day of our lives. Because now some of the smallest sounds and some of the smallest things are bigger than the thud of a stone. Want some examples? You're going to get some. Listen to water being lifted up to baptize a child. Just a trickle of water. But no stone, no matter how large, there's nothing that can stop Jesus from claiming that child as his own, just as he did for you in your baptism. Or listen to the sound of communion ware being opened, like you'll hear here. That's right, hear here in a couple of seconds. Okay? No stone, no matter how large, there's nothing that can stop Jesus from coming in this meal and to give us his forgiveness. Listen to the pages of a Bible being turned. Right? Not much noise. But no stone. No matter how large, nothing can stop Jesus from assuring us he is always with us, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the page. Or listen to the joyous hymns and songs being sung today. No matter how many glitches we have in our sound system this morning, no stone, no matter how large, there's nothing that can stop those who love Jesus from singing his praise. Or listen to our prayers. No stone, no matter how large, there's nothing that can stop Jesus from comforting us in our times of grief. Or listen to the laughter as you sit down later today to eat with family or friends, and I hope you get to, after church here today, uh, have dinner with family and friends. No stone, no matter how large, there's nothing that can stop Jesus from giving us a glimpse in our Easter meals, a glimpse of the feast to come. And listen again to the message that changes everything. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. At this time, the worship team has an Easter anthem that we are going to share with you now.
We stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, on this glorious day, fill your people with a holy joy at the resurrection of your Son, that we would tremble no longer before the grave, but live in the truth of your power to save. Lord, in your mercy. Be with Matthew, our Synod President, Barry, our District President, and all pastors. Keep them faithful to deliver to your people the apostolic gospel of your Son's death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us hold fast to the word preached to us, that receiving it with joy we may take our stand in it and be saved by it. Hinder all who would sow doubt into our hearts, and grant us courage to confess its truth in our life and conversation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless Joseph, our president, and all who make and administer our laws. Frustrate the forces of evil, and do not let our leaders cooperate with them or further their goals. Guard our armed forces as they stand watch for us at home and abroad, including Thomas, Emily, and Chris, Preston, Elizabeth, and Cannon, Teresa, David, and Maya, Grant, Chris, and David, John, Ben, and Debbie, Seth, Vanessa, Kendon, Christian, and Matthew. Let them serve with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Have mercy on the sick and those in any need, especially we left up in prayer those who are printed in our bulletin insert here this morning. And we would also take a moment now and pray silently in our hearts for all those that we know to be in need of the grace and mercy of Jesus today. Let the dawning light of the new creation in Jesus sustain them in faith, in accord with your will, grant them renewed health, a foretaste of their eternal healing in him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us joy in your son's great victory feast as he shares it with us from this altar. In the eating of his true body and the drinking of his blood and faith, overcome our sin by his forgiveness and swallow up our death in his life, that we may be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. At this time you may be seated for our distribution. <laughs>
Savior Jesus give you comfort and give you strength. Go in peace with joy, knowing that the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, and your sins are forgiven. a moment here. We stand for prayer. We pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you've given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Go ahead and sit down and be seated for our lesson.
And all God's people said, Amen. All right. So for those of you watching online that are coming to take communion here in the parking lot, I'll be out there in a few minutes. If you would like communion and didn't let me know, send me a text and I'll wait for you. I've, I've got time. My family's not going to eat until I'm done making the bratwurst. And yes, we are having official Easter bratwurst at our house today. So, um, uh, so anyway, so God be with you and bless you. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.